Two students meet in the hallway. One of them says to the other, Jim, I just made a 74 on my statistics test. Jim says, oh, that's nothing. I just made an 82 on my statistics test. Now, it turns out they're in two different classes, two different really large classes. Does it necessarily imply that, that Jim's 82 score is a better score relative to that group, to his classroom group, than Sally's score of 74? Well, not necessarily. And what if, what if we say, we add the, the idea, well, both scores are 10 points above the mean. Well, that's great. That's good. They're both, they're both above the mean. Does that necessarily mean that the 74 or the 82 is relatively better than the other one? No, because we really don't know much about the spread of the information, you see. If we're going to know whether one of these students or the other finished at the top of their class, we need to know something about the spread of the information. Now, this, this idea, this dilemma of, of having information from one distribution and another distribution and trying to compare them is made easy if we can level the playing field, if we can somehow make a calculation that tells us how many standard deviations from the mean both of those scores lie. How far from the mean in terms of standard deviation, not in terms of number of points on the score, but tell me how far in terms of standard deviation, that gives me a relative idea of how good this score is or how bad that score is. Now, this is the notion of standardizing information. That's what we're going to talk about in this section, and it's a tremendous tool. Take a raw score of, of like x, and what we want to do is standardize that score. We're going to call that standardized score a z-score, and it's nothing more than the number of standard deviations from the mean. The number of standard deviations from the mean. Now, I have a kind of a double arrow here because we can take z-scores and turn them into raw scores. We can take raw scores and turn them into to z-scores. We'll see how that's done in just a little bit. But to find out how many standard deviations from the mean we're talking about, the calculation is made like this. Take the raw score and, take and, and subtract the mean. Now, this is just distance from the mean, you see. And now divide by the amount of the standard deviation, and we have how many standard deviations are in that difference. You see, so now we have the number of standard deviations from the mean that this x value will lie, and that's what a z-score is all about. It's kind of, it's really a neat way to compare uh, values in different distributions. For example, here's the, the situation we had before. Sally made a 74, Jim made an 82 on the test. Uh, the mean for Sally's distribution is 64, Jim's mean, the mean for that distribution is 72. You see, they're both 10 points above the mean. That's what we mentioned earlier. Uh, the important matter, though, is the standard deviation. You see, if, if we have a, a, a relatively tight standard deviation, even though the distance from the mean is 10 points for both of them, if we have a tight standard deviation for one of them, that puts one of them in a much higher bracket than the other one that may have a, a relatively wide standard deviation. Let's assume the standard deviation for Sally's distribution is 5 and the standard deviation for Jim's distribution is 10. You see, so now if this difference is 10, then Sally's score of 74 is actually two standard deviations from the mean. It's right about here. This 84 is right here in the distribution. And for Jim, the, the difference in the, his score and the, the mean is 10, but 10 is the standard deviation. So Jim's score is only one standard deviation from the mean. So relative to their two uh, distributions, Sally's score is quite a bit better than Jim's score. Now, the, the z-score for each one of them is figured like this. Now, the formula is over here, but recall that it is take the raw score, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. For Sally's score, it would turn out to be, let's see, her score, 74. <clears throat> the uh, mean, 64 over the standard deviation of 5. This is 10 divided by 5 or 2. And that's the way we sort of intuitively found that just a bit ago. We can use the formula to find it like this. 
same idea for gem score. Now, if a uh, if a raw score lies to the to the right of uh, the mean, then it stands to reason that the z-score, the distance you see in terms of numbers of standard deviations, is going to be positive. If the score, if the raw score lies to the left of, or is less than the mean, then the z-score is going to be negative. <clears throat> A pizza parlor franchise specifies a mean of eight ounces of cheese on a large pizza with a standard deviation of one half ounce of cheese. Okay, any difference in that that is above three standard deviations is trouble. That means that the franchise, uh, the owner is likely to lose the franchise if it is discovered from a spot check. Uh, a random spot check that a large pizza has uh, the amount of cheese is beyond three standard deviations. Now, I would think that it would be more troublesome for the difference uh, if the difference is less than the mean by three standard deviations, beyond three standard deviations, less than the mean rather than more. You know, less than too little cheese is worse than too much cheese, in other words, I would think. But let's see what happens in this problem. On a spot check, a pizza is found with 6.9 ounces of cheese. Is there trouble? Is there trouble in this situation? Well, let's find out how many standard deviations from the mean we're talking about on this spot check. So this is the raw score. This 6.9 is a raw score. So we're using our formula for finding a z-score. So 6.9 minus the mean of 8 divided by the standard deviation of 0.5 gives us minus 2.2. So no, we are still within that three standard deviations from the mean range that we need to be in order not to be in trouble. Where it uh, looks like this uh, owner is skimping a little bit on the cheese, but not so much that they're going to be in such big trouble. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that we could, we could find a, a raw score from a z-score, and that would happen in this problem if we were posing this question. What is the minimum amount of cheese that can be used without trouble? The minimum amount of cheese. We want a raw score. We want a certain number of ounces of cheese, you see, that will keep us out of trouble. Well, let's see. So z is x minus mu over, uh, over sigma. And now I wanna, I'm going to solve this for, for x before we plug in values. And uh, that's pretty easy to do. Multiply on both sides by sigma and we get this because the sigmas would cancel on the right. Uh, adding mu on both sides would give us this. And uh, now let's plug in some values. Uh, the the z-score that is the magic number is uh, a, a z-score of three. That's three standard deviations. And I'm talking about three on the low side, so I'm thinking negative three where we really skimp on the cheese. How much can we get away with if we're skimping on the cheese? You see, that's the idea. So negative three, and then the standard deviation 0.5, mu is, is eight. So collecting here, we find x to be 6.5 ounces. So as long as we put more than 6.5 ounces of cheese on the pizza, we're not gonna get in trouble. In the last section, we talked about an example in which uh, we were discussing the uh, number of bushels of wheat produced per acre of land on a farm. And uh, I believe the mean was, uh, happened to be 35, and uh, I forget the standard deviation, but the problem involved finding the probability that a, a randomly selected uh, acre of property was going to produce between 19 and 35 uh, bushels of wheat. And it turned out that the 19 happened to fall right on uh, the the level of two standard deviations from the mean. So we said, gee, by the empirical rule, we can figure out that probability because all we need to do is, is calculate the area under the curve between negative two standard deviations uh, and, the, and the mean. And that was pretty easy to do. Well, what if a situation occurs where we're not exactly two standard deviations from the mean or not, not exactly one standard deviation from the mean? You see, then the empirical rule doesn't hold. All of our calculations before involved the empirical rule. So how do we deal with this? It turns out that our z-scores can help us immensely with this. That we can simply, uh, as I said before, level the playing field with all normal distributions and put them on a z-distribution. 
And it turns out that if the x distribution is normal, then the z distribution corresponding with it will be normal. And so we can do this. Now here is the standard normal distribution. That by standard, it means it's a z distribution. Now, in the z distribution, the mean is at zero, because after all, in that, that formula, z equals x minus mu, well, this would be mu minus mu, you see, for this particular place, you see, for, the, for this graph. So it would be zero over the standard zero deviation or, or zero. And then one is at the, the place of one standard deviation, two standard de deviations, and so on. These are just these scores down here. So these distances are in terms of standard deviations. So our idea uh, for area and probability holds just as it did before for the normal distribution. That is, if we're within one standard deviation, then by the empirical rule, and so on. Okay. Now, in order for us to discover probabilities involving raw scores and therefore z-scores that are not exactly on one or two or three standard deviations, there's a chart. And the chart, because z-scores are involved, can apply to any normal distribution. That is, we change our distribution to a z-distribution, or use z-scores, and suddenly we have a chart that will allow us to very accurately uh, calculate probabilities. Now, here's how that occurs. There are actually two styles of tables that we're going to have a look at. We just want to have some exposure to the two styles because some textbooks contain one and some the other style table. Now the book that we're talking about contains a table style that gives z values and uh, information about probability and area that is to the left of that z value. Now this is called the left tail style and uh, z scores give area to the left of the z value. That's the important thing. And it's always to the left. No matter whether the z is here or here or here, it's always the area to the left that is being given in the table. Now we'll look at the table in just a second and I'll talk about this situation in a moment. But let's slide over here to the other style. Now other types of tables uh, are called middle of curve style. And the middle of curve style gives value or area or probability that is between the given z-score and the middle of the curve, as the name implies. Now, I, I've noted here, note that we have a z of 1.22 on both of these uh, diagrams. And for this one, the, the area is 0.3888 that would be in a table which is the middle of curve style. Now come back over here and look at this one. Now this is giving area from this point all the way over here. So it's 0.8888, you see. And if we took half of this, this, this would be 0.5, you see this area would be 0.5. If we took that away from this, we would have what we have over there. So each of these styles of tables can be used to solve problems. Now, we're assuming here that we're taking raw scores. We're able to take a raw score and change the raw score into a z-score. And then we want to talk about the techniques for dealing with that z-score and translating it into an area and finding various areas uh, that lie under the curve. And let's talk about that a little bit. Now, we want to talk about how to look up a z-score uh, as well. But in this situation, we want to find the area that is shaded here. Now notice that I'm using the same uh, z-score that I had over here on the diagrams at the left. Let's talk about how to look this up in the table. What you do is you, you find the z-table, the z-score table in the back of the textbook. And you'll notice in the upper left hand corner there's a big z. And you look down below the z at the left hand column and you find the 1.2. And then you look across the top at the 0 0.02. And together, they give you the information about 1.22. So you just cross-reference those positions on the left side, on the left column, and the, uh, the upper uh, row, and you have the value 0.8888. All right. So a z of 1.22 in the left tail style of table, which we have, 
is this value, but we don't want all of this. That area is all of this area, you see. We only want this area. So what we're going to do is take 0.5 away from this amount. So we take the area that we have and we subtract 0.5 and we get 0.3888. Now, if we were using the other style table, we could read this information directly from the table. And I'll tell you right now that, that each of the tables has certain advantages over the other in certain situations. So we're going uh, we're gonna to find that, gee, if we had used the other table, it would be easier in this or that situation. But no matter. We're using the left tail style table in our, in our discussions here. Now, I have to mention to you here that you probably noticed already that the, my appearance is a little different on this video than it was in the segment just prior to this. Well, this is a different day. It's a different year, as a matter of fact. And when the previous video segments were produced, I was using the middle of curve style table. So from, from now on, and when we look at problems like this, in some of those situations, I just, I'm going to just cut in and use the left tail style table. In other situations, I'm going to let the tape run a little bit. And I'll let you know with a little subtitle that we're using the middle of curve style table, just so you'll have a little exposure to that. Because I think it's important to realize how both table styles are handled. Uh, but in those situations where I show you the middle of curve style table, I'm going to follow that up with a little discussion of how to use the left tail style as well. All right, so you'll get a lot of exposure to different kinds of methods. All right, let's take a look at this one. Now, in this one now, notice we want the area that's between negative 1.22 and 0. So we want this little area. Now, if we're using a left tail style, you see, table, then the z associated with negative 1.22 is 0.1112. Verify that by looking at the table, if you will. But what this represents is the area to the left of that z value. It is this area that this stands for. You see, that's what this is. But we don't want that. We want that area. Now, we're using a technique here, and we use this many times, that the area that lies completely to the right or to the left of 0 under the curve is 0.5, and we're using that idea here. So all of this would be 0.5. This is the part that we looked up, and we want the difference in those two. So we're taking, uh, the, our area is found by taking all of this area, 0.5, and subtract the value we found from the table, and that's this area, and the difference is 0.3888. Now you might notice that this is the same value that we had on the previous problem. And if we were using a middle of the curve style table, then we would look up just the 1.22. Now remember, that other style of table doesn't have negative values in it. It doesn't need negative values. You look up the positive counterpart, and, it, and really it's a 1.22 is over here. But there's this symmetric quality, you see, to our, our normal curve, and therefore an area associated with 1.22 is the same area as negative 1.22 when using that style table. All right, so that's the idea. Take a look at this one. Here we're, uh, we want to find the area uh, that is to the right of a z of 0.85. Now remember, in a left tail style table, we have information to the left. Now we're using this subtraction idea once again. We know that the total area under the curve is 1. So we're just going to take 1, all of the area under the curve, and we're going to subtract the area associated with that z value, because that's all of this area. And when we take 1 and subtract this, we have that left. So that's the technique. The z associated with 0.85 is this value, this area, or that probability. And we take 1 and subtract that amount, and this is what's left. And that's the shaded region. All right, let's talk generally about an, another situation. Now, <clears throat> when I say generally, I'm not assigning z scores to these two positions. I'm just going to call this z subscript 1 and this z subscript 2. Now, the idea in using a left tail style uh, table uh, for this situation is this that this, the, the, uh, the area associated with this z value would give all of this area. 
and the area associated with this one would give all of this area. So all we need is the difference in those two areas. And we're often going to have situations where we have, we want value or, or area or probability between two z-scores. And whenever that occurs, it's really easy using the left tail style uh, table because all we want is the difference in those areas. You see, we take this area and subtract the area associated with z sub 1, subtract that, take this, subtract that, and we have this. You see, that's the notion. So it's the area associated with z subscript 2 minus area associated with z subscript 1, and we have the area of the shaded part. Now, if we were using a middle of curve style uh, table, then it would be the area associated with the absolute value of z sub 1. You see, this is a negative z score because it's to the left of 0. But its absolute value would be a positive number, and we look that up in the table, and it would give this area and then look this up in the table, it would give that area because we're using a middle of curve style table. So the area associated with this plus the area associated with that adds these two and we have the total area that's shaded. Suppose we want to find the area between a couple of z-scores that are given like this without the diagram. Well, I suggest that when no diagram appears in your problem that you actually draw one and they don't have to be perfect. I'll show you what imperfection is all about here. <laughs> so you just kind of draw what appears to be a normal curve. You identify the center. Now that's a z of 0, you know. But we want the, the area that's between a z of negative 2.13. Well, gee, that's to the left of 0. You see, so it would be maybe about right here. So here's negative 2.13 and a z of 1.67. Oh, maybe that's about right here. And we want the area between, so we're looking for this area. And in doing this, you can easily create a strategy for uh, how to, to figure this out. Now, we mentioned before that when you're finding an area between two z-scores, if we're using this left uh, tail style of table, it's really easy because you just take the area corresponding with the larger z-score and subtract the area corresponding with the smaller one. So you're taking this area and subtracting this little area, and the area that's left is the area between them. So that's really all there is to it. Now let's, let's go to the table and look up the 1.67. Now on the table, you're, you're looking in the left-hand column for 1.6, and then you look at the top, the top row, for 0 .07, and cross-reference those two to find that uh, the area associated with 1.67 is 0.9525. So, a z of 1.67 implies an area, or a probability if you will, of 0.9525. And a z, going back to the table now, let's look up negative 2.13. Well, you look at uh, down the left-hand column at uh, negative 2.1, and along the top row you look for 0 0.03, cross-reference those two, and, and find that the area is 0 0.0166. So a z of negative 2.13 is associated with, or it implies, an area of... 0, 1, 6, 6. And now we take the difference between those two. So it's taking this one and subtracting this one, and we find, well, let me do it over here. It's 9525 minus this gives us an area in between the two z-scores of 0 0.9359. Here's another one, same idea, very similar situation. Find the area between these two z-scores. Now, these two happen to fall to the right of zero, uh, but you would draw the situation like this, same as before. And very quickly, you can illustrate that you have, let's see, a z of 0.32, that'd be pretty tight right in here, and that's 0.32. I'll do it like this, and then a z of 1.92 is out here, let's say. 
Let me bring that down to illustrate it. All right, and now we want the area between, so we want this area. And we think, well, our strategy is to find the area associated with 1.92 and subtract the area associated with 0.32. You see, and, that, and that's it. Uh, so we look in the table for a z of 1.92. We uh, look at 1.9 on the left-hand column, 0 0.02 along the top row. Cross-referencing those two, we find that area to be 9726. And we're going to subtract the area associated with the 0.32. We, again, we look in the table at 0.3 and then 0.3 on the left column. 0 0.02 on the top row, cross-referencing, we find that area to be 0.6255. And finding the difference, we find this area then that's shaded here to be 0.3475. Point three four seven one for that area. Here's a problem involving the conversion of raw scores to z-scores and z-scores to raw scores. We want to concentrate on the manipulative part of the calculation, but we don't want to lose track of the concept involved uh, and the context of the problem that we have here. The problem says fawns between one and five months old in Mesa Verde National Park have a body weight that is approximately normally distributed with mean 27.2 kilograms and standard deviation 4.3 kilograms. Let X be the weight of a fawn in kilograms. Convert each of the following X intervals to Z intervals. So we're converting the weights of fawns to Z scores, you see. Okay, the first one, we want a, an interval, a Z interval, that corresponds with an X less than 30. Now, we are going to use the relationship we talked about before, but in our problem, we know the mean and standard deviation. So, we'll replace the mean, the, the mu, with 27.2, standard deviation with 4.3, and all we need to do is replace x with the value that we have before us. The x is 30, so we'll replace x with 30, and then punch our calculator a little bit to find a z corresponding with that x of 30. The z is 0.65. So now we can, we can write this interval uh, as a z interval, uh, z less than 0.65. And that's really all there is to it uh, in this situation. Now, in the context of the problem we're talking about, x corresponds with the weights of fawns. And so uh, we, we want to talk about an interval of the weights of fawns being less than 30. Well, in order for us to calculate probabilities as areas under the curve, we need to convert to z values, and that's the purpose of the calculation that we just made. And we're not going to go through the process of looking up uh, the areas uh, in our table at this point. We're going to concentrate on the manipulative part of this uh, of the calculation of the intervals uh, for this particular problem. Well, let's see, 19 is less than x. Once again, we'll use the relationship that we used earlier, replace x with 19, and evaluate to find z is negative 1.91. Then we'll put this into the inequality format, so negative 1.91 is less than z. Here's a compound inequality, 32 is less than x is less than 35. We're going to take x values of 32 and 35 and convert them to z values. For x equals 32, we'll use the relationship we had earlier, replace x with 32, and we find the z of 1.12. For an x of 35, it's the same idea, replace x with 35 and evaluate. We find the z to be 1.81. And now we'll put this back into the compound inequality format using a z. So 1.12 is less than z is less than 1.81. Let's go the other way. Let's convert uh, z intervals to x intervals. Here we have a z interval, negative 2.17 is less than z. Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, interpretation of this is that we're talking about negative 2.12 standard deviations, or we are 2.1, excuse me, negative 2.17 standard deviations. It's 2.17 standard deviations to the left of the mean. That's really what we're talking about here for this particular z value. Now, in order for us to convert to x intervals, uh, to change a z into an x, we might take our equation that we used earlier and solve it for x. 
Now to solve for x, we would multiply on both sides by the standard deviation to get this, and then we would add the mean on both sides, and we have solved it for x. Generally, we would write the x on the left side of the equation uh, just for ease of use, and so we'll use this uh, formula then, or this equation, in order to find x values. Now, we know the mean and standard deviation, so when we replace the standard deviation with 4.3, it's z times 4.3, or usually it would be written as 4.3z, as we see it here, then plus the mean of 27.2. Now it's just a matter of popping in the value of z, whatever that value might be. And the value here is negative 2.17, and then evaluating we find x to be 17.9. And really, if we're, we're thinking about uh, a Fawn's weight that is 2.17 standard deviations below the mean, then we are talking about a Fawn whose weight is 17.9 kilograms. That's an interpretation of a z of negative 2.17. Now let's put this into the interval format though. We're talking about a z interval, negative 2.17 is less than z, and we want an x interval. Well, that x interval would be 17.9 is less than x. Here's another one. z is less than 1.28. 1.28. Well, we start again with the relationship that we discussed before and replace z with the value we have in this particular part of the problem and then evaluate. So a, a z of 1.28, that is uh, a value that is 1.28 standard deviations from the mean, uh, for our problem in terms of weights of fawns corresponds with 32.7 kilograms, you see. And in the uh, interval format, it looks like this. X is less than 32.7. Here's a compound uh, inequality. Negative 1.99 is less than Z is less than 1.44. Well, for a Z of negative 1.99, you see, using the relationship and popping in the value of Z, we find the x component to be 18.6. And for a z of 1.44, same idea. We would pop the z of 1.44 into that relationship, and we would find x to be 33.4. And now the interval associated with this would be this interval. 18.6 is less than x is less than 33.4. Now, all of these calculations, as I said earlier, would allow us to figure some probabilities but just sort of intuitively, let's answer a couple of questions. If a fawn weighs 14 kilograms, would you say it is an unusually small animal? Well, let's, let's think about it. The, uh, the mean for the weights of the fawns is 27.2 kilograms. Now, this fawn that we're talking about weighs 14 kilograms. That's quite a bit less than the 27.2, but in terms of the population, we have to think about this in terms of numbers of standard deviations from the mean. For an x of 14, we find a z of negative 3.04. Wow! That means that, that uh, this weight of 14 kilograms is 3.04 standard deviations below the mean. Yes, this would be a very, very small animal. If a fawn is unusually large, would you say that the z value for the weight of the fawn will be close to 0, negative 2, or 3? Well, if we're talking about a z value of 0, then we're right on mu, we're right on the mean. So that certainly wouldn't mean that the fawn would be unusually large. Uh, a z value of negative 2 means two standard deviations below the mean. So a fawn's weight corresponding to a negative 2 would be below the mean or less than uh, the average weight of a fawn. So if the fawn is unusually large, then certainly it would uh, correspond with a z of 3.